All right, welcome everyone to Citizens for a Healthy Jessup's Democratic primary for candidates running for state representative in the 112th. Uh, before we begin, I just want to say a few thank yous to the people who made tonight possible. Uh, first, Dave Bowman, investigative reporter from WNEP, who answered our call and agreed to be here tonight as our uh, moderator. Uh, the Troop Council, who voted to allow us the use of this great facility so that we can get enough people in here and have everybody with an opportunity to hear what's going on. ECTV is taping tonight, uh, so everyone knows. It will be on Channel 19 starting tomorrow, and it's going to run periodically up until the election. It's also going to be on their YouTube page. We're going to embed that in our YouTube, our, our Facebook page, so that everyone will have an opportunity to have access to it and use it. I want to thank our timekeeper, Bill Poconis, the president of the Lackawanna County Green Party. A big thank you to all of our volunteers and citizens for Healthy Jessup who've been working on this for several weeks and got here early today to set it up so that we'd be ready uh, to go. And of course, these guys right over here who've uh, honored us all by coming to tell us uh, where they stand. Tom Carlucci, Randy Castellani, Robert Castellani, Francis McHale, and Kyle Mullins. We do this uh, in every primary now because over the years that we've been working together as an organization, we've learned that it's critically important for us to find out where the people who want to represent us stand on the issues that matter to us. When we wait until they're already in office, that's too late. Thank you. So tonight's questions are not coming from just us, they're coming from a wide range of people in the community within the district. Some council members in, in communities in the district, some press professionals in healthcare, in economics, uh, the Scranton Times editorial board has offered a question, other citizen groups, and people from all types of walks of life. Uh, we tried really hard to get to every issue that we could so that we have a really good understanding of where these guys are coming from. With that said, thank you everyone for coming. We have a great turnout tonight. I'm going to turn everything over to Dave Bowman, who's going to uh, take care of the evening from here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm quickly going to go over some of the ground rules for the candidates right now and for the audience as well. First of all, all the questions will be submitted from this podium and there will be no talking when the debate begins so everyone can hear the candidates. Um, also hold your applause and things like that. We, this is about the issues today so let's hear what everyone has to say. Please turn off cell phones and electronic gadgets. We don't have stadium seating. It doesn't rise so be considerate of uh, not getting in each other's way and uh, the person in front of you and behind you. No smoking. Probably shouldn't have to say it but it's part of the rules. No flash photography because we don't want to increase distractions for the candidates. Also be respectful of the Troop Civic Center property and dispose of the trash in the proper containers. Hold the applause until the conclusion of the de debate. Once again, we want to make sure every candidate is heard and every candidate gets a chance to have his say. If at any time an audience member is out of control, we've got some pretty big people in here, so he or she will be escorted off the premises. Now, due to the number of candidates in the debate, to ensure adequate time for answering the questions, we're not going to have opening statements tonight. At the start, the candidates uh, were blindly chosen in numbers from one to five, and so we ask the questions in order. The second question goes, uh, number two gets first chance, and so on. So everybody, uh, nobody gets a strategic advantage here. All the candidate, the moderator, that's me, I'll be asking the prepared question shortly. With every question, the candidate who is uh, responding will go in progressive numerical order. We explain that would allow every candidate the opportunity to answer the question and also keep things moving in a cycle. Everyone up here at the stage, and they've been told the rules, gets two minutes to answer the question. And uh, the timekeeper over here is going to keep a close eye on that. After the two minute response following the first question, each candidate can get another 30 seconds to rebut answers from the other questions or uh, elaborate on the previous question. If time permits, we're going to have a section of time near the end of the debate for audience questions. They'll be solicited at the door. They're screened for appropriate comment by the Citizens for Healthy Jessup. And 
no questions containing objectionable content or personal attacks will be put forward. After all these questions have been asked and answers, every candidate will begin the opportunity of a three-minute closing statement. The order of closing statements will follow the same order as the answers to the first question. Our first question tonight, <clears throat> It was submitted by Scranton Prep Jr. and uh, a first-time voter in the general election, Danielle Deming. Her question, as a candidate running for state representative in 112th Legislative District, how would you go about attempting to prevent another act of school violence after the Parkland school shooting? We begin with Randy Castellani. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Can everyone hear me? Uh, first of all, I want to thank Dave Bowman for, for, uh, for filling in tonight and thank the Citizens for Healthy Jessup uh, for hosting this debate. Um, that's a great question, and, and being a former police officer for seven and a half years um, and, and a, a gentleman who wore the badge and, and carried a gun uh, for that long, I have a, a soft spot in my heart for, for school violence. I, I believe that with our new district attorney, uh, Mark Powell, and the rest of our law enforcement agencies who have worked diligently, especially in this area, uh, to corroborate with so many different groups and organizations to be able to have different protocols, policies, and procedures in place to be able to protect our, our, our kids in schools. I have a, a, a son, my son is in a, a sophomore in high school. We don't need to have our children concerned or our parents concerned about safety going to school uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm serious when I say this I believe that the individuals in our district especially the police chiefs do a great job in keeping our community safe our school safe and I also have to commend the superintendents as well as the resource officers who, who carry the gun inside the school uh, keep our kids safe as well so um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, to say that I, I've worked as a police officer and I will continue to work diligently and closely with a lot of the law enforcement officials to make sure that our kids are protected in our schools. Mr. McHale. Yeah. That's a timely question for me because I have a, a letter going out uh, within about a week to address that very question uh, along with my pro-life position. I see a relationship there. Um, after the, the, the Parkland shooting in Florida, um, they passed a law within weeks to require anyone to be at least 21 years old before they can um, purchase a gun. And the NRA immediately filed a lawsuit in federal court to block that. And the, the basis of that, that lawsuit is a Supreme Court decision that was passed in decided in 2008, the Heller decision, which allows anyone to purchase a firearm um, for valid uh, self-defense reasons, um, any firearm whatsoever. And this is my standard. This is the standard I set out in the letter, if you happen to get the letter. When there's no more need for active shooter training in our schools, okay? That's the standard for me, the, the amount of gun control that we need here, okay? So that, that would require enhanced background checks, um, at least 21 years old before you can buy a, a firearm. Um, anything to protect our students. When the government is unable to provide security and safety in our schools, um, you know, there's something radically wrong. Thank you. Mr. Carlucci. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, this is very simple for me. Um, our children are the most valuable assets to us, um, especially here in the United States. And what I think we have an issue with right now is clearly mental illness um, as well as gun control. Um, and what I, what I see is that uh, we need to, as we've reiterated before, is that extensive background checks is absolutely essential. Um, personally, I think that um, we also need to get much stricter on gun control as well. When it comes down to bump stocks, get rid of them. 
high capacity magazines, get rid of them. I take a hard stance on that because I have, we have all witnessed this over the past decade and a half now where gun violence has riddled our schools, have feared our, made our children fearful of actually attending schools. Um, this, is, this is completely unacceptable to me. Um, the resource officers that are, have been provided to our school districts, um, hats off to them. I mean, th these are courageous human beings who do everything in their power to keep our children safe. And the trainings that they provide to our personnel, our teachers um, and our administrative staff um, is absolutely essential to keep our children safe. So uh, I, I think that um, it's, it's important that we take a hard stance on this. And as I said, my hard stance is we need to have stricter gun control and extensive background checks. And I think that this will step into uh, preventing any type of school violence um, going forward. Mr. Mullins. I appreciate that question from Danielle. And it's telling that and unfortunate that that's a question on, on the mind of someone in school right now. I have a 15-month-old son who's going to be attending uh, school in a few years. And I'd like to think that he'll be growing up or going to school it, maybe in a world where he only reads about mass school shootings in the darkest pages of his history book. Our guns are safe when we're safe and smart about our gun laws. Uh, I fully believe that our, um, that the weapons that we uh, need to defend our life and, and family and property are far different from these high capacity, high powered weapons of war. And I think we need to be very clear uh, about that difference. I would uh, absolutely ex uh, support um, what these gentlemen mentioned, uh, expanded uh, background checks uh, especially, and we do need to take an incredibly hard look and hard stance on those incredibly high power uh, rifles. Mr. Robert Castellani. Thank you, and I do agree with everyone's statements um, in, in reference to this. Let me add, prevention before it happens. Um, you look at the internet, you look at these, these people that have committed these horrible crimes, um, they're, they're sending warning signals out to everyone, okay? It's, it, it's, it's, we need awareness with this. We need to watch this stuff on the internet. They're, they're saying they're going to do the shootings, they're saying they're going to do this, they're saying they're going to do killings. This is something that has to be addressed. Yeah, we need maybe to look into better security in our system, in our school systems also. Um, as they mentioned, gun control, without a doubt, um, has to be you know, looked into. But there are signs that are out there before these happen, before these incidents take place. And we, we can't be blind to this. We have to look at it. And if, the, if it is something that does show a red flag, it needs to be addressed. Thank you. The next question has been submitted by Jessup Burrow, Chief of Police, Joseph Walsh. As a candidate for state representative, what is your position regarding the ongoing opioid crisis and what do you think should be gun, done and how are you going to do it? Mr. McHale, you're first. Well, I think that that, that relates to uh, a lot of things. The federal government uh, first of all, I think has their priorities misplaced. You know, we spend so much money on defense spending. Um, you know, our economy is geared toward making the fast buck. Uh, you know, I think what we, what, what we need to do is, is, you know, as a government, the federal government, I think, first of all, needs to start allocating resources towards the problem. Um, it's a mental health issue. Um, it's also a national security issue because if our people aren't ready to work uh, in a global economy, you know, and they're sick and they need help, um, it makes us less competitive. Um, so um, I'm for a single payer national health care. I want us to focus more on national health care. I want us to get 
the private interests out of that. Who are the private interests? The doctors, the lawyers, the pharmaceuticals. You know, everybody's driving up costs. Um, we need to focus on the patient. We need to, you know, take care of our people. Um, so, again, I'm, I'm in favor of treating the person, um, you know, and we also have to, of course, be aware of where the drugs are coming from, but we're the big consumers here. We have a big drug appetite. And I live in South Scranton, and I see it, and I know you folks read it in the paper. Um, these people, some of these people um, are sick, they need help, and, um, you know, I think we have to allocate the resources for that. Mr. Carlosi. Thank you. Um, yeah, the opioid crisis um, is has gone too far. Um, it is does not discriminate. Uh, it, it will it will affect any family at any time. Um, big pharma is clearly the I think the biggest issue here. Um, you have just your regular average Joe being prescribed medication um, that is entirely too strong for them. Um, they end up finding themselves in a absolute crisis. And when it comes down to it, they don't have the money to support that habit that they unintentionally found themselves in. Um, I think one of the uh, I think one of the biggest things that we're seeing right now is the hard stance that our district attorney is taking on this issue, and I think that's extremely important. Uh, we have to put the fear into these drug dealers, these peddlers that are affecting these families and, and, ki and frankly killing people. Um, you know, I, I always. I was at a conference uh, a few years ago, and we compared this epidemic to, it was actually, it was about four years ago now, um, when we talked about if ISIS, for example, came over here and killed as many people as opioids have killed, we'd be putting billions of dollars into that fight, and we're not. So I think that's absolutely essential that we attack the res or where this is coming from, big pharma, make sure that the rehabilitation programs are going through all the strict regulations that they need to, to ensure that these people can bounce back um, from most of the time situations they never thought in a million years they'd find themselves in. Thanks. Mr. Mullins. I'm sure there's not a person in this room who wasn't affected to some degree uh, by the opioid crisis, whether it be a, f a friend or a, a family member. And I'm sure some in this room have, have, have lost loved ones to it. Um, the, the very critical and first step uh, we need to take at all levels, federal all the way down to the local, is removing the stigma of it. Um, when you have cancer, a disease, you go to the doctor and you get treated. Um, but we, are, we need to stop uh, criminalizing and stigmatizing uh, this, uh, this crisis and, and this condition. Um, and we need to, because these people don't want to be taking these drugs. These people don't want to be um, in this incredibly low and, and, and lost point. Um, they they want to... Um, they they want to feel uh, they they want to feel better they want to feel uh, accepted and they want to feel understood uh, so I think removing the stigma is an important first step and we it could start in this room um, we what we could be doing is is having far better coordination of services and resources between the federal government uh, the state government uh, including passing uh, Governor Wolf's uh, roughly uh, uh, 33 million dollar uh, budget proposal for um, uh, medicated assisted uh, treatment um, treatment courts uh, for which we should uh, commend judge uh, brace locally uh, for um, and access uh, to facilities uh, in, in treatment so um, I appreciate very much appreciate that, that question and, and you will note it's coming from law enforcement uh, we need far better coordination um, before uh, before it's too late and it affects one more uh, one more family in here Mr. Robert Castellani. Again, um, with the opioid epidemic, it starts in the home. It's all about awareness through parents, through schools, through better programs in our schools. Um, addiction is a disease. It's 
like Kyle did mention, it's not, these people don't want to be sick. They, they want to get better. Our programs are, most of them are 30 days and you're out. If anyone in this room had cancer and I sent you home after 30 days, what would your prognosis be? It wouldn't be good. We need better programs. We need to get these people better, get them back to work, let them feel better. I'm a, I'm a very big advocate on the legalization of marijuana with this also. In every state where it's legal, the opioid epidemic has dropped 25%, people. That's incredible in the eight states. There's 29 states in the United States that have it for medical purposes, and we're one of them. On the, on the legalization part, if every state is dropping 25%, that to me is a fact. That is not a speculation. So going back to what I said in the beginning, it does stem from home. You do need to have awareness in the house, and it does go to the school districts. But the treatment part with the legalization of cannabis would benefit not only the state of Pennsylvania, but would benefit the whole United States. Thank you. Mr. Randy Castellani. Thank you. Um, you know, Tommy Carlucci brought up a good point about our district attorney, and, and I believe Mark Powell is, is doing a fantastic job um, with the rest of our uh, law enforcement officials, school districts, resource officers. I actually sat down in a meeting uh, when I was in the state rep's office for the past 15 months with uh, Chief Timmy Trentley and Chief Guy Salerno from the Blakely Police Department with um, uh, Mark Powell and a few others talking about how we can put the resources together and, 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 and talk to our teachers and talk to our superintendents and make sure everyone is on the same page. And I just saw Ricardo Horn walk in the door here, who um, used to work for Arcadia Healthcare. Uh, we orchestrated a symposium last year in memory of uh, Christopher Lewis from Archibald, uh, who, who died from this particular epidemic. And we discussed a lot of topics. Uh, we brought a lot of professionals together uh, w within that room, uh, Dr. Linda Thomas, uh, Tom DePietro, a pharmacist, and we had a great discussion with a lot of professional people talking about a lot of things. Kyle Mullins, you talked about uh, Governor Wolf's plan. The center of excellence money that Governor Wolf uh, allocated to the MATs, I, I believe, uh, I, I give him a lot of credit because those monies are absolutely needed um, to help with uh, uh, the assisted treatment uh, and, uh, and the resources that we need to keep up with this particular ep epidemic. So, um, you know, the, the case managers need to be able to find housing for these people that, that suffer this, this disease and so on and so forth. So, you know, there's a lot of things when you talk about an opioid epidemic uh, that are here, uh, but, the, but it, it affects all our lives, family members, and I'm sure there are people who are in this room know someone or know of someone who uh, had a tragedy in their life due to this crisis. Our next question, and it's a bit of a long one, comes from Rosemary Boland, the president of the Scranton Federation of Teachers. For decades, Pennsylvania law prohibited school districts from furloughing teachers for economic reasons. Past state lawmakers recognize that even in difficult economic times, public schools must continue to offer students the programs they need to succeed. Offering these programs means properly staffing schools with certified public school teachers. With the passage of Act 55, districts across the state can now start to eliminate programs and furlough teachers to balance their budgets, even as student populations are increasing and they face tremendous challenges to meet diverse needs of our modern society. Scranton is ground zero for this blatant attack on public schools and public school teachers. If you are elected to represent the 112th district, will you take immediate action to repeal Act 55? And please explain your answer in detail, Mr. Carlos. All right. Um, so this hits home with me. <laughs> um, yes, I would. I would take measures to uh, to explore repealing that. There, there's a lot in that the education code uh, that needs to be looked at. Um, but this this all goes really comes down to what should have been fixed in the beginning. 
Um, Scranton School District is in an absolute crisis. Um, and this, in my opinion, could have been prevented years ago. Um, I, I started a grassroots organization that acts as a community alliance for public education. Uh, what that does is it gets people uh, involved in the decision-making process. Much of what Mary Rose Bolin and the, the Scranton Federation of Teachers need to do to maintain their collective bargaining, um, to maintain uh, the proper amount of staffing, uh, for the children to succeed. Um, I, I would do everything in my power to ensure that the teachers um, have what they need to implement and students have what they need to succeed. Um, but when it really comes down to it, it, it's a collective effort. This has been a collective effort for a long period of time. Um, the group I started acts as a watchdog group. Uh, we have evaluators who measure the governance practices of school boards. And uh, it, it's, it's a difficult task, but it needs to be done because as you've seen with Scranton, they found themselves in a situation where they had to lay off dozens and dozens of hardworking teachers. And I, I think that's absolutely unacceptable. So to, to answer the question, yes, I would absolutely take a look at that to repeal that because we want to make sure that teachers have their collective bargaining rights um, and they can maintain, like, our, uh, maintain the resources that they need to implement to allow our children to succeed properly. Mr. Mullins. Our, uh, one of our most basic uh, responsibilities as state lawmakers uh, should be uh, to provide for the thorough, efficient, uh, and, and adequate uh, funding of our uh, public education system. Um, I, there is such a disparity between rich and poor school districts and, and funding uh, per pupil uh, among those. Um, we, we, should not, uh, we should not be valuing one student's education uh, to the tune of uh, thousands of dollars uh, more or less uh, than another. Um, in my, uh, specific to Ms. Boland's question, um, in my uh, experience uh, for the last seven years uh, as legislative director to Senator uh, John Blake, one of the first um, amendment uh, you know, uh, processes or experiences I had was actually successfully working with uh, the other side of the aisle to preserve teacher seniority um, in, in an effort uh, to uh, implement economic furloughs. Unfortunately, um, that, uh, we, that, that didn't hold the day this year. I didn't win the day this year. And, um, and so I, a short answer to the question is yes, I would support uh, the, uh, the protection of uh, the seniority of, of our uh, excellent uh, men and women who uh, teach and care for our, our children. Um, I also uh, think we should be, um, I'm running time here, um, I also think we should um, just in, in addition to uh, you know closing that uh, gap of inequity, we should be um, uh, far better at uh, supporting our public education system, uh, starting with Harrisburg. Mr. Castellani. Uh, to add what Kyle just said, uh, yes, of course, I would support it. Um, children are our future, number one. Under Governor Corbett, um, it went from 50% to 30% for funding in schools. Uh, Governor Wolf has improved on that, um, but we do need, we do need better methods uh, of this. Um, again, I don't want to keep going back to a loss of revenue, which we don't have, but we need money. We need alternative methods of revenue in our, in our state. Um, you know, we keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing, uh, whether it be for school districts or whether it be for anything within, within the state. Um, getting back to the legalization of cannabis with me, um, if you look at Colorado, they have $250 million um, in revenue last year from $1 billion sales, $1 billion in sales. That revenue from Colorado would basically justify in the state of Pennsylvania, which is twice the size, you're looking at 400 to $500 million back to our state. Not to count on the jobs, which would look at 30 to 35,000 jobs for the residents of PA. The, uh, to me, it's, it, it's really a no-brainer here with this. We need alternative revenue. To, uh, to go back to the question, of course, I would support um, this here with, with the schools. It's, um, 
like I said, children are the future. And um, like I said, we do need revenue. We do need revenue from an outside source, not borrowing anymore from the state. We're too far in debt. Thank you. Mr. Castellani. Thank you. Uh, I do have to agree with the other four candidates. I, I also, uh, yes, I would uh, absolutely repeal or do my best to repeal uh, Act 55, make sure our teachers uh, are, are, have their rights, make sure that we fund our schools properly. And let's talk about this for a minute because I, I do stand behind Governor Wolf's initiatives. Uh, one of the things I think we need to do in this state is tax our drillers. We need a severance tax. And I believe with the severance tax, a fair one, we can create millions and millions of dollars that we can put into education. And I think that with a severance tax implemented, we can fund our schools. There's a lot of things we can fund, uh, not just education. Uh, we can all co also keep our schools safe. Um, so there's, there's so many dollars out there that you know, we should have recouped years ago under Gov Governor Corbett. But the Republicans in Harrisburg were too busy lining their pockets with money and the, and the special interest in the lobbyists we're, we're taking care of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the legislators and not worrying about the people of this state. So I would absolutely be in favor of the, of the severance tax um, to help fund education because I think that's where the money's going to be able to come from. Mr. McHale. Yes. Um, yesterday, Annette Palutis had a letter to the editor in the Scranton Times. I don't know if anyone saw it. She's a former president of PSEA. And I happened to be a delegate to the Democratic Convention with her in 1984, so we know each other well. And the, the basis of, the, uh, of her article was um, a discussion about this Republican plan to shift school property taxes over to the sales tax and the income tax. Um, when I worked for Governor Casey, I was down in Harrisburg with them working in the Pennsylvania Commerce Department for over seven years. Um, he was re-elected um, in 1990, um, in November of uh, 1990, and within three or four months, there was a very severe recession. And during that recession, um, he had to lay off uh, approximately 2,500 state workers he had to enact the largest tax increase in the history of the Commonwealth. And this is the problem. If we listen to, if we follow that plan, and you know, I know they have these humongous majorities down in Harrisburg. Um, that's the topic for another discussion, um, the Republicans in the House and Senate. It wasn't like that when we were down there. Uh, we had control of the House, the State House, for all eight years, Governor Casey was governor. We actually, Senator Mello was actually the majority leader for two years. I think two years, it might have been more in that eight year period. But I'll, I'll tell you what, I know there's a Republican candidate in here for this very office. I will, if they agree to increase, change the Constitution and make the state income tax progressive in nature, I would be open to some property tax reduction. But I'm not going to hold this all education hostage to the whims of, of an economy that's been dominated by, over the last several decades by a Republican. Mr. McHale, your time's up. Okay, thank you. Our next question is submitted by the Progressive Women of Northeastern Pennsylvania. Recent efforts in our state legislature tried to restrict women's right to timely and accessible abortion services. If elected, would you support or oppose any restrictions to Pennsylvania women's right to a safe and legal abortion? Mr. Mullins. This is an important, uh, this is a very important matter and uh, we should be clear. Um, federal law Federal court decisions uh, are clear on this matter, and I believe I would not uh, support uh, any additional restrictions uh, uh, levied by um, by the state legislature. Mr. Castellani, I am totally against abortion, 
and I will, I will take that stand in front of everyone here tonight. Um, to me, it's, it's a human life as an embryo, it really is. Um, I can't, I can't, I, there's no way that I could do this. Um, I did get a survey from them and I did research it and look it over. Um, proper care of women, of course, in facilities and taking care of them is one thing, but actually proceeding forward with an abortion, it's just something I could never do. Mr. Castellani. I was raised the same way. I was raised Catholic. I was, a, I was, a, I was an altar boy. I'm a pro-life Democrat. Um, you know, and, and I absolutely would, would, uh, would agree with my brother on this. Uh, not too many things we do agree upon, but I, but I will agree with him. Um, it's not something that I, that I would ever, ever uh, before. Uh, it's the way I was raised, and no disrespect to, uh, to anyone, but uh, that's, that's my opinion, and that's my, uh, that's my stand. Mr. McHale. Yep. Um, I was happy. I was a tenure track professor at the University of Scranton in the School of Management, and I ran into Bob Casey on the street. He said he was going to run for governor, and I was down in his office while he marched around the state campaigning, and I was working out of his office for six months uh, for him to get the endorsement against Ed Rundell, and we succeeded. And this really motivates me. I've been a member of the Pennsylvanians for Human Life. I've been at at least 25 annual marches in Washington. Um, I'm very strongly pro-life. I feel since 1973, we've been living under the Roe Republic. For any reason, any, any person's life can be taken away for any reason. So um, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about the Democratic Party. Um, I, again, I have a letter. It's pro-abortion pro position. I wonder why Hillary Clinton only received, just barely won the county. She lost Luzerne County by 25,000 votes. Um, so again, for those of you that are registered Democrats, you'll be getting a letter from me next week discussing this very issue. Mr. Carlucci. Thank you. Um, I, can, I can respect um, your stances on that, um, but I think Roe Ro versus Wade got it right. And um, to limit access to a safe and legal abortion, I, I'm not gonna take that away from women. Um, I think the government already has infringed on women's rights too, too much as it is. Um, so, uh, so yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> they should have access to that. And I think that's why I'm a supporter of Planned Parenthood as well. Our next question was submitted by an economic development professional in the re region. Job creation and good paying family sustaining jobs are important to any community. In what ways do you believe you can impact job creation in the 112th district? Mr. Castellani, we begin with you. To get back to uh, what I said about the legalization again of cannabis, we need revenue brought back into this district. And um, if anyone here uh, um, that I'm running against can say how they're going to bring jobs back in here um, without money, without borrowing, I, I would like to hear it after I'm done answering this. We, we, we lack that. We, we, don't, we don't have the money. Our kids grow up. I have three children. Uh, one, uh, my daughter Vanessa runs a Head Start program in Scranton. My other son is in Coastal Carolina on a track scholarship, and my son... Sam was awarded the Cody Barace scholarship. He is at prep. Um, these, I have a terrible feeling that when they do finish school and college, I'm not going to see them again. Maybe on holidays and, and something like that, they'll come back for a visit. But in order to bring industry in, we need revenue. We need better roads. We need better buildings. There's so many things that we need. Um, it, it could just go on and on. We don't have any of that now. So to, to make the justification that we're going to have better jobs without the revenue, I, w I would love to see that. With the legalization, like I said, of cannabis, you're looking at initially $500 million brought into the state, and along with that 35,000 good-paying jobs. I know it's a touchy situation for a lot of people, and I've been speaking on this since last summer. 
I spoke already in halls on it. I speak it on Facebook continuously. It is the only way for money to be generated and put into our state. Thank you. Mr. Castellani. I believe that states that invest in, in education brings jobs here. Back when I was a commissioner, I got sworn in in 2000, and I spent five and a half years with Lackawanna County as a commissioner. I spent many meetings, sitting in meetings with Austin Burke, head of the chamber, many groups and organizations trying to bring businesses into this area, relocate into this area. And I think it's very, very important to know that these businesses that are looking to relocate here and we're looking to create jobs here, they want to make sure our educational, we have a stable education. Uh, our, our schools are, are, are in good health. Um, we want to, they want to make sure that you know, we have safe schools. They want to make sure that we, you know, we, we are out there preaching to um, the school districts that you know, we, we need to make sure that their, their teachers are compensated. We need, to, we need to make sure that we invest in our education department in order to bring jobs here. I believe that that's key. And I'll go back to the severance tax again. I believe if, if the drillers were taxed the right way, we would have enough money to take care of our educational system and bring jobs back into the area. Mr. McHale. Yeah, um, everyone remembers the uh, polar vortex this winter when it got really cold. Um, for a couple of weeks in early January. What happened was um, we were actually importing liquefied natural gas over to the northeastern part of the United States from Russia and Europe because the spike in energy um, prices caused a shortage here in the United States. We have on our doorstep the deepest shale in Pennsylvania, up there in Susquehanna, Bradford County. If someone like President Trump sets off a, a catastrophe in the Middle East, um, we could be a tremendous beneficiary of that. And he, he's going over to Israel in a couple, couple weeks, and he could, he could do something, say something stupid over there that unfortunately could benefit us because Boston, New England wants our shale, Governor Cuomo won't let it go through New York State. Philadelphia wants our shale. We have it all here. It's all capped. And it could be, it's at our doorstep. And we could have it for a couple of years. It could be ours. So get ready, folks. I know we suffered for a long time. The Pancoast mine disaster, the anniversary, I saw it on the news just down the block here. Our day is coming. Mr. Carlucci. Um, this is, uh, this hits home, hits home with me because I actually left this area for a while um, because jobs were not being created. I had a degree in education and public policy. There just weren't jobs for me. Um, so I actually left and I went to Pittsburgh for four years. And I'm glad I did because I got to see Pittsburgh revitalize itself very similar to how, how we are here, old coal town, they were an old steel town, they revitalize themselves. And um, the other question is, why would businesses and corporations wanna come here when, you know, we, it's the dumping ground at this point. I mean, we have one of the largest power plants and now an expansion on the landfill. It's gonna be a lot harder to try to get businesses and jobs to come here. Um, so I, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, the situation we're in, but based on what I've done in Pittsburgh and worked with the revitalization programs, um, we just have to take a look at what kind of some kind of what Randy said here with the education. We have to follow the economy and where it's where it's going. So technology is big. So instead of putting a power plant there and instead of expanding on a landfill, where's the technology? Technology is ever growing and it's going to continue. Um, I mean, new cell phones come on every what. 60 days now at this point. Um, so it's, we need to get in tune with what's happening and how to drive this economy forward. That is how jobs are gonna come, that's how jobs are gonna end up getting here. But we're not taking the, we're not even exploring the appropriate avenues to ensure that. Instead, we're, we're making decisions on putting things in this area and it has become the dumping ground and it's unfortunate and I plan on doing everything in my power 
to, when, if I get to Harrisburg, to bring jobs here and not let special interests or lobbies or lobbyists uh, influence us to put things here that aren't going to help our economy grow. Mr. Mullins. So I, I'm living the, the, the dream of a, of a lifetime. I got to uh, marry, the, marry the girl of my dreams and start you know, and build, a, a cho choose, have the opportunities to build a family uh, right here uh, where we grew up in an area we love so much. Uh, and, and find those opportunities and grow up near or raise our family near uh, near ours. Um, we we it, we should dedicate ourselves to making sure that that's an option uh, for every uh, generation, um, starting with those uh, in school right now, uh, because I certainly uh, would like to think that uh, northeastern Pennsylvania would stand a fighting chance of um, of being an option uh, for our son. Um, it starts with uh, it starts with the strong, uh, stronger, much stronger commitment to public education. Uh, it starts uh, in the guidance offices to make sure that we are preparing students for a career-focused education. Um, that we are uh, firmly committed to our, our trade, our uh, trades programs, our vocational, our technical schools, uh, because there are good family-sustaining uh, uh, jobs available. Um, we just need to be providing a skilled and trained and prepared uh, workforce. Um, we need to make sure that we tell companies uh, from outside of Pennsylvania that we're actually open for business. We have one of the highest uh, corporate net income tax rates at 9.99%. Uh, we, we could and should absolutely be uh, doing a phased uh, lowering of that rate uh, at, yet at the same time, making them pay their fair share and closing tax loopholes like the Delaware loophole. Um, we, of course, need a uh, we need fair uh, local tax policy um, and uh, a shale tax is something I uh, support mightily. So this is why we need that experienced leadership in Harrisburg to translate uh, to our home, uh, to translate and, and bring those uh, opportunities back here to our home communities. Our next question is submitted by Joanne Kilgore of the Pennsylvania chapter. She's the Pennsylvania chapter director of the Sierra Club. With so much money flooding state politics, how would you work to lift up and prioritize the voices and needs of the constituents in the district over well-funded lobbyists and industry groups? Mr. Castellani. Well, that's a great question. and I will pledge tonight that as far as the, the, the lobbyist groups and the PACs, I will not take one penny from the lobbyist groups or the PACs in this, in this election. But talking about the, the Sierra Club, um, I do have a, a past in uh, protecting our environment. And uh, one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm very proud to say that I was able to help clean up our Lackawanna River years ago, back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, for those of you who can remember the Lackawanna River, uh, way back when, um, as far as our environment is concerned, it was a very dirty river. People didn't even want to go near that thing. Uh, we, we put together a, a, a group of people in conjunction with Bernie McGurl from the Lackawanna County River, river Corridor Association to help clean up our river. Um, so I've worked diligently with a lot of groups and organizations uh, as far as our environment is concerned. But uh, as far as the, the lobbyists and the, um, uh, the PACs, I will not take any money from any of those people. Mr. McHale. Yeah, yes. Um, you, you know, um, I wonder, this area has been ravaged, was ravaged by savage capitalism 100 years ago. And um, we all know what the effects have been. And then we've got the Keystone landfill here. Um, the, and the Alliance landfill in, in Taylor. And, you know, coming in, garbage coming in here at break, breakneck speed. Um, you know, uh, we, we've got PP&L built a power line from Berwick, came over the, the west side of the valley here to take power out of here. That's why they built the power plant up here in Jessup. The power, I don't like that. I don't like the fact that they build these these power lines in these plants to take power out of here to New Jersey. I want to see the power used here. So as far as the big money in politics, that, that was the question. Um, if Bob Casey were alive today and you told him that Western Pennsylvania 
was solid Republican except for Allegheny County, he'd laugh at you. So the problem with Go Governor Wolf has down there is you've got this Republican legislature by wide margins, both the House and the Senate. So they're not going to do anything to control, you know, the big money that's coming in. Um, so what we've got to do is we've got to broaden the appeal of the Democratic Party to put some controls on that money. Mr. Carlucci. This is the biggest problem in my eyes that Harrisburg has. This is why Pennsylvanians have not been able to move forward. Um, lobbyists and special interests have absolutely infiltrated the decision-making process in Harrisburg. Um, and this is, this is a growing concern of mine because, I, I mean, I vowed as well not to take any money from any PACs, any lobbyists, um, and I think that's important. Um, I, I know one of our colleagues here, or one of our uh, candidates here, uh, you know, had the first finance report had over 75% of his money from special interest. And I guess what we have, to, the only way to be able to stop this going forward is who do you want to represent you? Do you want the special interests to represent you or do you want somebody who has stepped out on the front lines, advocated for taxpayers out of his own pocket and will continue to do so? Um, we, it has to start with the legislators. They have to stop accepting money. Governor Wolf has made this apparent in all of his statements and this is why, like I said, Pennsylvanians are not progressing forward. So. Um, you know, I hope Mr. Mullins has not accepted any more of that because at this point we're at a very high rate of percentage of money from special interest in PACs. And I feel it's very clear that that's where the influence is coming from um, and why things are not progressing forward. I appreciate Mr. Mullins, go ahead. I appreciate the question. Uh, and I, uh, in, no in no way, shape, or form, um, uh, have any hesitation uh, of, the, of the people inside this district and outside of this district uh, who have the faith in my experience and my judgment and my leadership that I could render and bring to this district on day one. I am, if Mr. Carlucci um, has an issue uh, with, with the type of support um, I've received from individuals locally, from members of law enforcement who have faith in my leadership, uh, from service workers, from nurses, uh, doctors, physicians, um, those, um, those groups who uh, defend our environment, whose endorsement I'm, I'm proud to have with the conservation voters of Pennsylvania, then I, uh, I call into question the type of priorities and service um, that uh, and, and judgment that he would render once there. Though these aren't uh, these aren't efforts that I would. Um, th these aren't people who are uh, doing things uh, or, or supporting me because they think I will do something. They know uh, the work and the character uh, I possess, and they know I'll be ready uh, on day one uh, to bring uh, sound judgment. I absolutely support greater uh, government transparency. Uh, transparency in uh, in PAC in, in PAC contributors and um, government reforms generally. So, thank you, Mr. Castellani. Yes, to answer the question, the it, it is a huge issue, um, you know, with the environment. We have a gas power plant in Jessup. And I remember when this was first going up, there was rumors, thousands of jobs are going to be brought to Jessup. It divided a town. There was people that were for it and people that were against it. And it was, it was horrible. I remember the fighting, the council meetings, uh, families fought over it. There's 30 jobs up there, people. 30 jobs with the new power plant. That's pathetic. And they are destroying our environment. The gases that are coming out, they're misleading people that they're not harmful, and they plan on putting more in Archibald? That's the next move? I mean, it's, to me, it's just, I, I, I can't even fathom what we are doing to our environment in our district. Solar energy, for me, is, is an answer, too. We only use 1% of solar energy in the state of Pennsylvania. We could be using 30% for electricity. I will never accept any money from any lobbyists, ever, ever. I will support you 
as your state representative, I will be transparent in everything. I will hold town meetings monthly for you to see you know where we stand. I will do live feeds weekly or every 10 days so you will know exactly where the district is at and exactly what is going on in Harrisburg. There is nothing that I will ever hide, ever. Thank you. The next question was submitted by the Friends of Lackawanna. This is a yes, no question. Are you in favor of the Keystone Sanitary Landfill expansion? If yes, why are you in favor of this? If no, what would you do as an elected official to prevent communities like ours from being dumped on with landfill expansions? Mr. McHale. Yep, um, I, I have a letter that went out uh, around two weeks ago on this very issue. And um, I talked about it, it's a huge issue. Um, first of all, I'm against the expansion. Um, and I took issue with um, DEP secretary's statements in January in the Scranton Times. Um, he talked about calling balls and strikes. That's not, his, that's not his constitutional mandate. His constitutional mandate is to look out for the, the health, safety, and welfare of every citizen in this commonwealth. Um, I support Governor Casey um, in his efforts to restrict trash coming into our region from other states. Um, and I think we really need to, you know, um, step that up. Um, uh, aside from that, it's a big issue. There's birds flying all over the place. There's hundreds and thousands of them. Um, Scranton, where I live, we're, we're caught in between the two landfills. Um, they're right adjacent to downtown. They're flying around. It's, it's, it's not good. Um, we're making progress in our downtown, and we need to have a clean environment. So I'm, I'm against the, that landfill expansion. Mr. Carlosi. Uh, I am also uh, against the landfill expansion. Um, I think I think a lot a lot more things need to be done, um, especially when it comes to the application process in general um, is too easy. Uh, the DEP needs to step up their obligation and their responsibilities, um, and they need to have tougher restrictions. I, I went to Mid Valley High School for the uh, the research on um, air toxins, for example, and. Uh, as they were explaining their conduction of their research, there was, there was a piece of that research that they easily could have done, and that was to measure the, the MRLs, the minimal risk levels for humans um, and air toxins. And uh, the fact that they, they aren't taking the appropriate steps to do that um, is, is mind-boggling to me. Um, and, and it goes into other additions within the 112th district as well, and that was uh, um, the wastewater discharge, for example. Um, I actually looked into that and I went on the DEP's website and went to find the most simplistic explanation of this so I can spread it around to my friends and family and that was the overview of the wastewater discharge and uh, I clicked on it and it said, page not found. Um, so this is, again, just a lack of transparency um, as well. So yes, I'm, I'm absolutely against the, uh, the expansion of the landfill and any other harmful um, expansions um, on, uh, on things within the 112th district. Mr. Mullins. I, I too am, uh, am opposed to that and, um, and, and I, ha I, do have, uh, I do have concerns of uh, any time that um, it is reported that there's the potential uh, for uh, health impacts or risks to uh, my family or yours. What, we, what I would propose as a, as a state legislator is stronger environmental oversight, uh, a more rigorous uh, and, and routine and recurring uh, 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 reapplication process, um, uh, better recycling. Uh, we are not recycling near, nearly enough uh, to keep uh, waste out of our landfills. Um, and we need recurring uh, health assessments uh, in the in, in immediate vicinity and in the surrounding communities uh, so we can keep an eye on uh, those health impacts and to the degree to which uh, uh, they are happening. And this is, these are things that I'm uh, prepared to bring uh, uh, leadership and legislation to uh, the moment I get uh, to Harrisburg. Mr. Castellani. Yes, of, of course, I'm, I agree with all my colleagues. I'm totally against it. 
um, we're destroying our environment. Um, I would vote against any expansion with any landfill um, out there in our district and outside our district. The DP, DEP needs to be looked into and, and uh, we have to stop looking the other way. Um, regulations have to be enforced and really no one is above the law when it comes to this. Um, everything has to be checked in every aspect of these, uh, of these landfills and uh, especially these you know, that are, want to expand. Um, if, they were, if, they were, if they resided in areas where there was no population or anything like that, but again, they're destroying the environment and um, everything needs to be looked into with this. Mr. Castellani. I also have to, I also have to agree. I, I, will, I will not support any expansion of any landfill, especially one that sits right here in our backyard. You know, we talked about job creation. What job, what companies want to come here and build next to a dump for a power plant? Maybe another power plant. Nobody, nobody wants to relocate here. So these are things that we absolutely can't afford uh, to continue to, to, to do. Um, I've had some conversations with some people, uh, John Mello from the Citizens for Healthy Jessup, who talks about making sure that we continue baseline testing uh, for not only the uh, the power plant, but also for uh, the landfill, making sure that we do hold DEP, EPA, and the rest of the regulatory is responsible and accountable and make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And if I'm sent to Harrisburg, uh, I will absolutely uh, I'll pledge uh, to each and every one of you here tonight that I will do that. Um, I've worked closely with a lot of these people. I've, I've sat down with, with Pat Clark. Um, who plays a key role with uh, Friends of Lackawanna, uh, talked a, a lot about some of the health issues and things that are out there uh, because of the landfill. You know, I want to raise my children here just like you do, and our seniors need to be protected as well. So this is something I absolutely cannot support. The next question submitted by Patrick McKenna of the Scranton Times Editorial Board. Given widespread concern in the district about two to three new gas-fueled power plants, how would you vote on state subsidies for five nuclear power plants in the state, keeping in mind that their closures significantly would increase demand for gas-generated power? Mr. Carlosi. Uh, well, thank you for Mr. McKenna's question. Um, so the, uh, can, can you actually repeat the, the last part of that question? How would you vote on state subsidies for five nuclear power plants in the state, keeping in mind that their closures significantly would increase demand for gas-generated power? Well, I would vote against it um, for the subsidies for them. They're already getting, they have a 10-year tax abatement here at Invenergy. Um, so, I mean, that's... It's basically where I would vote on that. I really can't expand on that any, any further. Mr. Mullins. Sure. The, the, latest, um, the latest I heard or, or believed was that there was some discussion of altering um, the uh, type of energy in our alternative energy uh, portfolio standards. Um, and that, uh, that is something I would uh, oppose. Uh, I, would, I would oppose, I would, it would of course depend on the uh, level and amount of a carve out for them, but that is something I would uh, have concern with and uh, oppose. Mr. Castellani. Mr. Bowen, vote against, absolutely. Mr. Castellani. Yeah, I have to agree as well. I would absolutely oppose that. And as uh, Kyle had mentioned about uh, other types of uh, of energy, uh, but this is something that uh, I am not for, and I would absolutely oppose it. Mr. McHale. Yeah, I think where Pat was coming from, he's, he's wondering about um, the environmental effects of, um, keep in mind that nuclear is, is non-polluting. You have a problem with the radioactive waste, but in, when you look at the energy mix of things, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's an issue of, you know, how, how do we attack this issue of global warming going forward? And I, I, I really do think that nuclear plays, has a role to play in that. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, state subsidizing, I think there's a, a threat by um, 
to close the plant down there in Harrisburg if, if, if at Three Mile Island if they don't get state subsidies. But I am, I am concerned about the instability in the Middle East. Um, uh, you know, I know we're producing um, much more oil, but if something happened, um, you know, and if we, again, we're, we're taking coal-fired fire, plants offline right now at breakneck speed, um, we start taking nuclear out, what are we left with? We're left with um, oil and gas, so, and, and wind and solar, but that's not, it's not there yet. So, um, you know, I, 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 I like nuclear because it's not polluting. That's what I like about it. The next question comes from our audience. If elected, will you do everything in your power to help raise Pennsylvania's minimum wage to not less than $15 per hour? Mr. Mullins. I appreciate that question, and that this gets to, uh, this is a very much a quality of uh, life issue. Um, uh, the, the simple answer is, is yes. Uh, and uh, economist after economist, uh, will tell you that uh, states that have increased uh, the minimum wage um, see a better job creation and retention. Um, I also believe as part of that we, we must close the gender pay gap because Pennsylvania women receive an average of $10,000 less than their male counterparts. And until we close that gap, uh, I, don't, I don't know where we're going. Mr. Castellani. Yes, I would agree with Kyle on this 100%. Um, we do need better paying jobs, without a doubt, in, this, in, in our district and, and also in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, we, ha you know, we have beautiful homes. Uh, we do need su to sustain them. Um, there is no, the, the minimum wage now, right now, uh, for a family to get by on, it's, it's impossible. It really is, let's be honest. There's, there's, there's no way. Even a single person has a difficult time with it. So, um, you know, without a doubt, I'm for this, and I would definitely vote for it. Thank you. Mr. Castellani. Yeah, this is a real interesting topic because uh, this is, I, I am for raising the minimum wage, but not to $15 an hour. I had a conversation about a year ago with a local businessman uh, that came into the, the state office, and this was a hot topic last year. And he had said to me, um, about, about raising the minimum wage to $15. And he said, you know, I have a, a local business. He said, I, I cannot afford to pay my people $15 an hour without raising the price of what it is that I'm, I'm producing. And I thought for a minute, you know, that, that's pretty interesting. And he said, I also have two kids in school. And if, if either one of those two children come out and maybe they, they, they get a job for twenty-eight dollars or $30,000 a year, and they would actually end up be making just as much as someone who would be making $15 an hour, who doesn't have an education, who didn't go to school. And, and I thought he brought up a couple of very good, valid points. So I think if we listen to our people out in the district and our small businesses who are, who are trying to strive and keep their, their, their head above water, um, I, I would be for raising the minimum wage, but I would not be for raising it all the way up to $15 an hour. Mr. McHale. Um, I'm for raising the minimum wage, and let me tell you what I think the problem is. You go down to Scranton on the courthouse, John Mitchell's statue, it's inscribed there. This is a quote from him. I wish to see the interests and ideals of labor and capital fairly reconciled, not by surrender, but by mutual understanding. To my mind, it's alarming what's going on in this country. This tax farce that was just passed by the federal government. It just makes it worse, okay? It, when I was growing up, it used to be the labor unions would set the wage standards. Who would set it? The United Auto Workers Unions. They would have their contract every several years, and, and that was the benchmark that everyone fouled, okay? Now, organized labor is it's alarming. Uh, it's, it's, di it's disappearing, okay? So what we do every eight years now as a country, we bounce back and forth between the Democrats and the Republicans, okay? Now we're at the point where our economy is so unbalanced, 
in favor of capital over labor that we could really have an economic collapse, and I'm very concerned about it. Mr. Carlucci. I, uh, I would be in favor of increasing the minimum wage. Um, I, 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 I have spoken to people similar to um, the person Mr. Castellani has spoken to, and I understand the struggles on both sides of the, the table there. Um, so I would be absolutely in favor of raising it to $12.50 um, uh, to start with, and I think that we can strive and move forward from there. Um, I, I was f fortunate enough, I should say, um, I work, I work in a field right now um, as a behavioral interventionist um, for a school for children with autism and uh, the retention or the, the turnover rate on employees is extremely high and, um, and it's a very tiring job as well. Um, and they, we, get, we get paid exactly $12 an hour. I mean, it's, it's, it's extremely hard. And I don't know how, and I'm a single guy with no family I, and I, I'm working alongside people who have families. I, I don't know how they do it. It is absolutely mind-boggling. So do we need to increase it? Absolutely, 100%. The next question is submitted by a member of Citizens for a Healthy Jessup. Now that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court has ruled on the gerrymandering of congressional districts and realigned those districts into what is deemed to be a fair and equitable manner, should the Pennsylvania State Senate and House of Representative districts be similarly realigned during the next census? Would you be in favor of an independent commission to establish district boundaries, or would you be in favor of keeping the present system of majority rules? Mr. Castellani. I was asked this question before, um, any, any type of gerrymandering that is going on, as um, long as it's done in a district or in a state where there is no political power, look, look, no Republican or Democrat group looking to take over the district, um, then I'm, I would be totally against it. Mr. Castellani. Look what happened to this district back in 2012. We had two incumbents in 2014 going at it in the, 100, the old 115th district, now the 112th district. And as far as I'm concerned, I would absolutely be in favor of an independent commission. Uh, the legislators should not be the ones to drop the district. We should not be able to pick and choose who can vote for us and what our district should be. I believe it should be independent. I don't know, let's say we take two Republicans, two Democrats, two independents, and two Green parties. And let, let them come up with a, with a solution where our district should be drawn. But the mere fact that the Republicans are in, uh, are in power, um, you know, they, 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 were, uh, they were doing it their way. And I'm glad that the, the court stepped up. I think they did a great job uh, just recently with the congressional districts. Uh, they're not perfect, but I think they're a lot better than they were. So uh, I would be absolutely in favor of uh, some type of independent uh, a group or commission uh, to be able to, uh, to fix the problem. Mr. McHale. Yeah, when I was working in Harrisburg, I lived with a guy from Carbondale, and he had a best friend. His name was Terry Malley, and he would come over every now and then at our apartment. And his job in the state house was to, he was a Democrat, was to work on the gerrymandering thing, to analyze. So it goes on on both sides. So to take the politics out, out of it as best you can, I would definitely favor a commission. But the U.S. Supreme Court is going to decide this issue this summer. There's, there's two cases pending before them. And so they will have a say in this matter. But, um, I, you know, I'm definitely in favor of the commission. Mr. Carlosi. Yeah, if you take a look at our district maps, um, it's frankly, it's embarrassing. Um, I, I think that you see um, just a blatant grab of power um, with our political parties, with particular pol political parties. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm absolutely in favor of, um, of an independent citizens commission to, to, to direct that process. I think it's extremely important that we have that transparency. Um, because after all, the people within those lines are the ones that we're representing. You know, the, these are the people that they should have, the people in those lines should have a say in exactly how this is being drawn out. 
not a particular political party. So yes, I'm in, I'm in favor of that. Mr. Mullins. I believe gerrymandering is a, is a direct uh, threat and affront to our democracy. Um, I don't believe our founding fathers ever intended for it to get like this, for our maps to be drawn the way they are. And I think it is, uh, I think a large credit is due uh, to the citizen population uh, for the attention uh, being turned to this. Uh, we all have social media now and we can see how just crazy these districts are drawn. Um, so I firmly believe that voters should be picking their politicians, politicians shouldn't be picking their voters. Um, one of the first pieces of legislation I worked on, proudly worked on, was an independent citizens commission that was tasked with both uh, redrawing uh, fair lines uh, for the state house, the state senate, and uh, U.S. congressional districts. I believe uh, our, um, I believe decade after decade, uh, such entrenched and powerful majorities um, have, have th their day is, it should finally be uh, uh, numbered as it relates to um, how, we've, uh, how we've been going through this process. And um, I've, got some, I've got a number of Republican friends um, who uh, are actually, uh, who wouldn't, wouldn't admit to it, but would share with me privately that some of these majority, the, the size and strength and, and unruliness of these uh, large majorities in Harrisburg um, have become just too large, too large to, uh, to have order. Um, and that's something um, that is a, is a priority of mine uh, when I get to Harrisburg. The next question was submitted by Joanne Kilgore of the Pennsylvania cha chapter, she, and she's the director of the Pennsylvania chapter of the Sierra Club. Given how challenging the political climate is in Harrisburg and across the state, how would you work to advance environmental policy in the face of strong, well-funded opposition? Mr. Castellani. That's a great question, and I think the, the less money that you, you take from the, the lobbyists and the special, special interests will not, it will make your, your, your vote and your opinion and what you stand for a lot easier to be able to determine. Uh, there was a little discussion earlier about taking money from the special interests and taking money from the lobbyists. Once again, there has been billions of dollars that have been given to legislators. Um, as far as the, the drilling goes. Uh, and that's why we don't have a severance tax, because people are being bought, they're being bought and paid for. And I think the, the, the less we have uh, involvement with the lob lobbyists and the PACs, I think much better off we will be. Um, and once again, I will commit again to not taking any money from the PACs or lobbyists, because I think they affect the way that our legislators vote. Um, and once again, I, I believe that you need to be independent. And I want to be an independent voice for the people of this district. And that, that is a great question. And I, I believe not taking money from the special interests in the PACs, uh, you can represent the people that, that you represent the way they need to be represented. Mr. McHale. We, we, we need to put limits on contributions from, uh, you know, in Pennsylvania, it's wide open. There's no limits on how much you can give. How do we make that happen? We need to get majorities, Democratic majorities, in the State House and the State Senate. I find it ironic that we have, um, you know, um, a Democratic majority, registration majority in the state approaching a million votes, and we're down by, you know, 20 votes in the Senate. We're down by 40 votes in the House. I, 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 I'm trying to comprehend why what is wrong with the appeal of the Democratic Party in this Commonwealth when we have those types of majorities? So the, the way to get control of the unregulated money is to get control of the legislature. The way to get control of the legislature is to broaden the appeal of the Democratic Party. Mr. Carlucci. To maintain these environmental policies that are being introduced um, I believe starts exactly where uh, Mr. McHale had just touched on, and that is um, with our legislators. Um, the, with the influence from lobbyists and special interests, it's, it's, it entire, it's completely hard. I mean, Governor Wolf has explained this over and over again. 
Um, and I think that um, we need to empower the people um, who want this. I mean, Citizens for a Healthier Jessup, Friends of Lackawanna, they, they had to do it on their own. They had to step out there and do that. We need our legislators to do that as well. Um, and I think a reduction in the size of the state legislature is, is another start for that. Um, these decisions are are very hard to make uh, when you have you know 203 um, you know representatives. Um, I go by this. Uh, it's called the um, Dunbar Rule of 150, and that is um, it's a theory where if you have uh, an organization trying to make a decision at 150 people or more, um, the consensus and conclusion of those decisions come harder come by harder. So I think the reduction of the state legislature is, is a start in that right direction and also um, to ensure that we're not taking money from, from lobbyists and special interests. Um, I, I know that you know, Mr. Mullins had just said you know, prior where he was receiving this money from and you know, that's just my, that's a concern of mine. I, I'm, I'm also, I'm a, I'm a citizen here too and that's a concern of mine. Um, you know, sure there are some PACs but there, the 75 percent of it's from Harrisburg. That's not in our district, and this is what we need to represent, the people within this district. Mr. Mullins. I'd like to get back to the question on the clean environment. Um, clean air and clean water um, is our most uh, Im important legacy that we could and should be leaving um, our next generation. Uh, and how do we do that? Uh, we do that by uh, opposing and restoring the incredibly deep uh, cuts uh, to our uh, agencies that uh, regulate and protect our uh, streams, our air, um, and our soil. Um, we do that by holding uh, gas companies, uh, drillers, um, accountable. Um, and we do that by levying a responsible severance tax, which unfortunately failed by one missing vote in the uh, State House just a few months ago. Um, clean environment is, is good for business. Uh, anybody who says that um, a, a strong economy or, or a strong business climate um, is not compatible with uh, strong environmental uh, uh, oversight and regulation um, is, is incorrect. Um, one of the things I was most proudest uh, you know, to work on uh, while in Harrisburg was property assessed uh, clean energy, a bill that passed overwhelmingly in the state Senate, a very Republican controlled state Senate, and um, is uh, advancing through the uh, state house that would allow uh, affordable, um, accessible capital uh, for uh, commercial and, and industrial uh, clean energy projects. So those are just a few of the uh, things that I've worked on that I uh, believe in. Um, to support um, uh, stronger environmental uh, laws and advancement. Mr. Castellani. Yes, absolutely no money from lobbyists. Um, you have to do what's right, bottom line. Uh, the environment is very important. Transparency is even more important um, within your district. Your constituents put you in this office. Uh, you need to represent them, uh, follow through for them, uh, clean air and water, is an absolute given. Listen to the people's voice in your district. Again, no money from high lobbyists. Listen to your district. The next question was submitted by Dr. Alice McDowell of Marywood University. There is a current need for an influx of certified nursing assistants and skilled nursing facilities in the district. To improve this shortcoming and increase the competencies of this level of staff, do you think the state should consider providing education funding to facilities to train and certify new staff? Mr. McHale. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, CNAs, certified nurses assistants, they probably have maybe a two-month course. Um, that should be standard. Again, I'm in favor of a single-payer system for health care. I think, you know, we need to provide funding. We need to get the special interests out of health care. Um, we need to um, take care of our elderly. We, 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 we need to, you know, focus in on, um, you know, that, that issue because it's a competitiveness issue in Pennsylvania every year. Um, 
there's tens of thousands of employees, the health care goes up, um, the retirees' health care is an issue. So we have, to, we have to make it available, but we have to make it cost effective. And the way to do that is to get, get control of the special interests. Mr. Carlucci. Yeah, I actually came across um, a study not too long ago, and it had the, uh, it ties in both of these here, um, the most respected professions in the country. Um, and the most respected profession was nurses. Um, the, most, the least respected profession was lobbyists. Um, and I, I would be more than happy to provide that information to you guys as well from where that research study came from. But, um, yeah, I, th I, I mean, increasing the staff and support for our nurses is extremely important. Yes, I mean, it's the cornerstone of, of our healthcare system, I think. Um, as doctors are running around like crazy, these, these nurses are doing, uh, you know, the bulk of the work here. Um, and I, I, I know uh, a nurse personally, and she does more logging in, I swear, than, than anything. Um, so I think the, an increase in funding to ensure that they have the proper staff and training is uh, absolutely essential, and I'm in full support of that. Mr. Mullins. Without a doubt, I would uh, support, uh, support increased uh, uh, funding for these, uh, for these programs uh, for CNAs. Um, they are on the front lines of our health care system, and we thank God they are. Um, I would also support uh, nurse, uh, you know, improved or increased nurse-to-patient ratios because I believe it to be a public safety and uh, patient safety and, and uh, health safety matter, uh, as well as, uh, as, as stricter uh, you know, uh, time limits that, that they can be uh, asked to uh, or be forced to take overtime. And um, I, I think we ought to be um, you know, paying them a, a far more respectable uh, wage uh, than, I, than I believe they are. Mr. Castellani. Yes, I would also agree with Kyle. Um, uh, we need better funding for them. If you look at the nurses, too, in the hospitals, as well as hospice, I mean, these were nurses and CNAs, you know, they work around the clock. They put in tremendous hours during the week, and, uh, and they're not compensated the way they should be. So, you know, they are the front lines, you know, before the doctors. Um, and, it, you know, they have a hard, hard job. They really, really do. So definitely uh, uh, we, we, we need better funding for them. Mr. Castellani. Yes, I, I would also agree with uh, additional funding. I'm going to go back to the year 2001. Um, when I was a county commissioner, we oversaw the Lackawanna County uh, nursing home for those of you who are familiar when the county ran that facility and it ran great for many years but back in the early 2000s I remember it was shot down statewide in reference to some additional funding for CNAs uh, and something that we, we tried and we fought very hard for as it was mentioned by I'm not sure who but th they are the people who are on the front lines uh, working every day to uh, to help your loved ones uh, who are in facilities who are in hospitals and uh, and I absolutely believe that they should be compensated I'm going to go back to earlier, I said that I would be absolutely in favor of raising the minimum wage to a certain number. These people deserve the $15 an hour for what they do and what they do every day. And I would, I would be in favor of, of that, um, as well as, um, you know, the ratio. Kyle, you mentioned the ratio. I think you're absolutely right. I think for those of you who have had loved ones in the hospital, um, you know, you see nurses and doctors running around, some patients are standing in the hallway. Uh, there's a lot of that going on that needs to be fixed, and it's not just in one hospital. It's in all the hospitals here in, in the region. So those are things that we need to try to fix. Um, it's not going to be easy. I'll go back to the severance tax again. I'm going to beat that like a dead horse because I believe if we got money from the drillers and the severance tax, we got our fair share, we'd be able to fund a lot of these things that we're talking about tonight. The next question was submitted by Jerry Crinella, the Jessup Borough Council President. In Jessup, we have witnessed a building of the second largest power plant in the country by a company that will generate massive revenues from providing electricity to large metropolitan areas in New York and New Jersey. Unfortunately, Jessup is seeing little benefit, comparatively speaking. The local school district is receiving even less, and the county is getting no benefit. The temporary construction jobs have almost ended, and the prediction of the local economic stimulus never materialized. 
Unfortunately, towns like Jessup will also experience losses in property values, negative demographic changes, and tremendous environmental issues. This situation will most likely not be an isolated event with proposals for similar power plants within the district. As a candidate for state representative in the 112th district, what plans do you have to help your constituents be protected, have their voices heard, and regulate or monitor the activities of a business such as this? Mr. Carlosi. So, uh, that, I mean, that is correct. And um, when Invenergy went up here, um, I, I think, I mean, you got a bad deal. So what, really came, what it really comes down to. And I think that's why, um, you know, Citizens of a Healthier Jessup was formed. Um, they, you have to stand up and protect, uh, you know, your, your, everything that ended up happening. Uh, the property values decreased. Um, you also had, admittedly, air toxins in the air. And there's a daycare in a, what, what are there, three Little League fields right next to it? Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, they had to step up and do what they needed to do to ensure the safety going forward. But um, as a state legislator, uh, everything in my power I would do is to make sure that they're empowered, they have the resources and tools necessary to educate their public and, um, and get involved in the decision-making process. Because as we see, a lot of these, um, you can put up some roadblocks um, and you can do it at the local level. So it's extremely important that as a state legislator, I do my due diligence in Harrisburg to ensure that we have the correct information to provide to them. Um, in addition to making sure that, as I said earlier, putting a lot of pressure on the DEP to make sure that they're doing their job properly. Mr. Mullins. This is a very important issue locally. Uh, we all, whether we live in Jessup or we live in any of the surrounding towns, we all live uh, in the shadow of this new facility. And whatever uh, health impacts or uh, air or water quality impacts there are, uh, they are felt regionally. Um, we must, uh, this is an issue that um, divided a town, it divided families, it divided a, a group of friends. But as a state legislator and as, as someone who lives in the uh, in this you know in this great area in this in this great community, uh, we must look forward uh, and not backward, not litigate the past, but bring healing uh, to those divisions I mentioned. Um, I I would pr uh, propose and actually have been working on uh, minimum host agreement standards uh, that would uh, adequately compensate not only the host community but surrounding communities and the school district and involve them all in the negotiation of that process but set a minimum uh, baseline per megawatt uh, power uh, to ensure adequate uh, compensation and that is something I'm uh, incredibly proud of uh, to have been working on. Uh, I also believe that we should hold energy companies uh, accountable, uh, not only accountable uh, to maintaining and guaranteeing uh, safe operating standards and environmental uh, standards, but also um, communicate better with the community. Let, let people know when you're, and, and fully educate them when a, a, a new uh, part of the process is coming online. Um, I think that's uh, incredibly uh, vital. Uh, and I would also propose routine uh, recurring uh, health assessments. Uh, as part of that legislation. Mr. Castellani. Where was the awareness with this power plant? Why was it built so close? Who do we blame? Jessup Council? Our state rep at that time? Our state senator? Everyone knew that this power plant was being built. Everyone knew where it was going. Yet it seems like everyone st stood by idly and let this happen. Where, where was our public officials at this time? I understand Kyle's point, not going back in the past. And you do have to go future with everything you do. But this could have been prevented. This could have been put back miles away from the town of Jessup. And it's a major eyesore. And again, as you drive by, the smoke that comes out of there, they say it's not harmful. In 10 or 20 years from now, how do we know what it is? Everything with the people should be put first. That's my stand. 
I, I just can't understand how this even came about. Who got paid off with this? Where did the money go with this? And from the question, all the jobs are over with. There are no jobs for anyone at the power plant. I got an estimate from a friend, 30 jobs. Like I said before, there was supposed to be thousands of jobs. There was no transparency when this was built. The people were lied to. They were deceived. As your state representative, you will never get that from me. I will always have transparency. You will always know what's going on in the district. Thank you. Mr. Castellani. Yeah, Jerry, it's a great question. Jerry, and I, I heard you speak at many meetings in the past, uh, some of those meetings that Citizens for Healthy Jessup had. I do remember one distinctly uh, that was held at, at one of the, uh, the firehouses, I believe it was host company number one off of Lane Street, um, when, when the former rep stood up and said, we hit the lottery for a half a million dollars, which I thought was an absolute joke in hindsight uh, after seeing what some of these companies who have built these plants in other places, what they received, uh, was absolute, absolutely absurd and, 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 and mind-boggling to me how we can say things like that. Jessup didn't get what they deserved, uh, either did some of the other local municipalities and school districts. You know, not just Valley View, because Jessup sits in Valley View, but what about Ben Valley? You can see that plant very clearly right off that Casey Highway from, from, from Oliphant Troop. I think holding our regulatories responsible and along with the, uh, the companies that built that particular facility, we need to hold those people responsible. Uh, I think the host agreements really need to be looked at. Uh, that's one of the things I think that, uh, that happened in, in Jessup. Uh, I know Aaron Owen is here. Uh, from Archibald Borough Council. Aaron, I have a message for you. Don't let that happen in Archibald. Make sure that you sit down with, with your, your legal people. Talk to the people from Jessup. They've experienced it. It was a nightmare. I think we need to continue the baseline testing, which is something I talked about earlier. John Mello, I know you're here uh, from the Citizens for Healthy Jessup. Thank you for all your your uh, informative information. I've sat down with you many times to talk about a lot of this stuff, and I can assure you, uh, if I'm uh, fortunate enough to get to Harrisburg, you got my word. I'll be protecting everybody. Mr. McHale. Yes, as, as I said before, um, you know, this power line that they built from Berwick to uh, New Jersey via the Lackawanna Valley over the hilltop over there on the West Mountain that cuts across and takes the power out of here. It's a replay of what went on 100 years ago here. The, 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 what happened 100 years ago was they mined the coal and they took it out of here by train. So here what we have is the same thing. We got this tremendous shale play very close by so they're take advantage, taking advantage of the natural resource and we're not getting any benefit out of it. Again, we have to keep the pressure on DEP going forward. But as I said to you before, this is gonna happen again. I think it's gonna come around again. Now, when we went to Harrisburg with Governor Casey and I was down there with him for almost eight years, he put that, this was a dream of his. He did a lot of things up here. That Casey Highway, that 60 mile, 16 mile industrial highway named after him. Okay, that can be a real big asset for us. We have a glut of natural gas. We have a major surplus across the country. Consequently, all these wells are capped up there. The pipeline capacity isn't in place to get it out of here. If something happens, we're going to be a mini boom area. It's going to be like a, a Charlotte or Houston. It could happen here. We got to be ready for it, okay? That, that we have to have the government in place that works for us, not against us. Our next question was submitted by Archibald Councilwoman Erin Owen. 
In consideration of the amount of elderly property owners in the district and the need for funding in our schools, what is your position on the much discussed prospect of eliminating property taxes? Mr. Mullins. My wife and I pay property taxes. And uh, I know this is a crushing burden on seniors, on fixed incomes, and some families uh, just starting out. Uh, the notion that um, a, a continued commitment and an increased commitment to public education and uh, property tax solutions um, that, that they uh, can't coexist um, is, simply, is simply false, is simply untrue. I was proud to have worked in Harrisburg um, on the Senate Finance Committee when we passed a uh, resolution uh, changing the Constitution last year to allow us to target property tax relief just to homesteads so we are not shifting a $14 billion uh, tax burden onto individuals off of corporate taxpayers, off of corporate tax uh, and properties. So. Where, where do we go from here? Um, a $14 billion cost by, uh, by virtue of that uh, amendment uh, that we were all proud to uh, work on and, and support out of the state legislature uh, cuts that cost in half, making real solutions a, a, a viable option, of, I believe, a, on the horizon uh, as a possibility. And that's one of the things I am looking extremely forward to, uh, to getting to Harrisburg and working on and delivering on uh, and delivering uh, that effort uh, once I get there. Mr. Castellani. The property tax is a dinosaur. It really is when you think about it. Uh, approximately 10,000 senior citizens a year are losing their homes from this devastating tax. Um, there's speculation going on in Harrisburg there's talks going on in Harrisburg, but no one is really addressing the issue. Senate Bill 76 is out there, and I would vote on this in a heartbeat to eliminate the tax. Not something I would look into, not something I would talk about, discuss. It, ha it has to end. Um, it's, it's a tax that, again, senior citizens is crippling for, as well as families it's crippling for. So it's, it, it's something not to look at over and over again and talk about. This is, a, this is a tax where you need the words action, okay? Action, not talking about it, action. Thank you. Mr. Castellani. Yeah, this is something near and dear to my heart. I've been working on this for the last almost two years, uh, bringing the Pennsylvania Taxpayers Coalition to this area probably four or five town hall meetings on Senate Bill, House Bill 76, the Elimination of School Property Taxes. It's very simple, it works. The Independent Fiscal Office in Harrisburg, the numbers are real, uh, you know, raising the sales tax 1% and the wage tax 1.8%, everybody pays. You go to the store and you shop, you pay. If you rent, you pay. And the beauty of it, we're all equal. You know, there are people right now that are not paying for, for school property taxes. And in order to help fund our, our, our public education and keep our schools afloat, this bill works. Um, you know, our school districts right now that, that collect uh, the, the school taxes, the delinquent number, uh, I'll give you just a, for instance, Valley View School District, uh, the delinquent taxes every year range anywhere from two hundred to $300,000 every year. They're chasing that money. They need a cash flow. We need a cash flow uh, within the state, and these school districts can benefit immensely. And, you know, the 1.8 wage tax, the people who complain about it are the people who are making a lot of money because they got to pay more. For our working middle class families that I support and, the, and, and, and our seniors who are struggling, you know, I have seniors come into the office who they, they can't pay for their, their medication. Do I keep my lights on in my house or do I pay for my, med my medication? What am I going to do? Because I can't, I can't pay everything. And they're suffering and they're hurting and we need to help them. This bill works and, and I'm for it. Mr. McHale, as I said to you before, how, how many tax cuts, 
how much more regressive, alter like you're going to remove it, the property tax, and put it on a sales tax, um, a wage tax that is flat, that is regressive. It makes the inequality worse, folks. We just went through a massive tax cut on the national level. Um, you know, again, what, are, what is a big... Uh, I don't want to compromise with the Republicans. I want to defeat them. I don't, want, I don't want to play their game. I said to you before, I'll be for something if they agree to a progressive income tax increase. Then I'll talk, then, then I'll talk to them about, you know, it might require changing the Constitution. So what? Let's do it. But, but you know, it's, it's at the point where our economy is being driven by that mindset. And I'm telling you, it's going to do us in. Um, we need, we need health care is a big driver in, in state government costs across the board. Medicaid, retirees, benefits, active employees. Let's lobby our federal legislature, le legislators to get a single payer system and, and, and create some stability in health care. It's going to eat us alive unless we get control of it. Mr. Carlucci. So eliminating um, school property taxes for our seniors um, is something that I, w I would vote yes for right now um, due to the fact that I I've seen it and it's long overdue. They're losing their homes left and right. Um, but as, as somebody who has a degree in public policy, I understand the unintended consequences to that, to that bill as well. Um, I understand that by increasing the income tax and, and wage tax, we're also lo we're looking at, um, or the sales tax, we're also looking at uh, possible, if we ever have an economic downfall, our schools, are they going to have to close their doors? I mean, it's, it's extremely important to me that we look at all those avenues before we make a decision like that. But I understand that our elderly people, our, our senior citizens are, are losing their homes left and right. Um, so with that said, if, if 76 does not go through, um, I, I plan on absolutely rolling out a, a school property tax rebate program um, that uh, uses, and everybody asks the question, um, you know, where's the money going to come from? Well, uh, you know, our, our, our SINS tax, for example, you know, raise our revenues over $300 million a year. Um, with the mini gaming um, uh, expansion, uh, we could also tap into money from there. I mean, as, as Robert Castellani had, had mentioned earlier with marijuana, um, we can also grab our money from there uh, if that was you know, to go through recreationally, obviously. But uh, I think that this is the burden that we need to take off of our senior citizens. A lot of our senior citizens have, have Alzheimer's and dementia, and that's, that's, a, that's a burden in itself. It's such a large burden. So can we do them a favor and at least, at least take their property tax relief and give, or give them a rebate program so they don't have to struggle. Um, I, what happened, gaming was sold to PA based on the premise that they were going to reduce taxes, Homestead. And, um, and the lottery was sold to PA to help seniors. I say we use that money to actually help them. That concludes the question and answer portion of our candidates for him tonight. Each of the candidates now will have three minutes to make a closing statement and we are going to go in order that was drawn by lottery earlier tonight from your left to your right beginning with Randy Castellani. Thank you Dave. I want to thank once again the Citizens for Healthy Jessup for having this debate. It's healthy, it's good, people can listen to what each one of the candidates have to say and pick and choose who you believe would be the best candidate or the best legislator that you want to send to Harrisburg. You know, I served as a police officer, a county commissioner for the last 15 months in the State House of Representatives as a chief of staff. I want to be able to have affordable college funding for our, our children. I want to be able to make sure our education system is well funded. Our schools are safe. Our seniors are taken care of. It will not be a tool for the Harrisburg elite or the lobbyists or any of the PACs, as I mentioned earlier. I'm my own person. And if, you, if, you, if I'm 
lucky enough to be elected. Everything I said here tonight, I will follow through on. I'll be here for the people. I want to be your voice in Harrisburg. And I will have an open door policy, as I've always had in public service. Most of my adult life has been in public service. And I've got to meet a lot of great people along the way. I've knocked on a lot of doors, listened to a lot of constituents, talked to a lot of them, listened to their, their concerns, things that are important to them. And I want to take that to Harrisburg and be your next representative in the 112th District. So thank you. I appreciate uh, the great turnout here tonight. And um, don't forget to, get to come out and vote on uh, May 15th. Thank you. Mr. McHale. I would like, likewise thank uh, citizens for a healthy Jessup for this opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, I want to just tell you a little bit of my story. Um, I'm an attorney. Um, I'm also a certified public accountant. I have a master's in business administration from the University of Scranton. Um, I came back here to Scranton after law school a while ago. I worked for Joe Corcoran. We were about 26 years old in the city controller's office there. Um, I went back to school at night. I got my degree in, account in accounting and went on to become a CPA. After that, in 19, that was two years, in 1980, I was appointed by President Carter to be the director of the census here in Northeastern PA for a year. I uh, did that for a year. And um, after that, um, I started um, teaching at the University of Scranton as an adjunct faculty member. Um, then I was offered a tenure track position there, and I was happy. I thought, here, here I was, I was going to teach here for the rest of my life. And as I said to you before, um, the powers that be selected Governor Casey, a three-time loser. And the reason why they selected him, because it was a lieutenant governor by the name of Bill Scranton, who was Dick Thornburg's lieutenant governor. Okay? Mr. Scranton, they realized that Governor Casey, given his integrity, his pro-life position, could dig into Gov Lieutenant Governor's strength in the middle part of the state. And lo and behold, we won. And the end result is we had, and I was heavily involved in his cam campaign from start to finish. Two years ago, I finished up 29 years in state government here in Scranton. He transferred me back here after his administration. So the most successful Democratic politician in Northeastern Pennsylvania, think about what he delivered for us. He was a pro-life Democrat, and that's what I am. Thank you. Mr. Carlosi. I think we all have a, I think you all have a tough decision to make on May 15th. Um, and I want to start off by saying uh, I'm the type of person who represents the citizens that he's, he's among. Um, I started an education organization to ensure that I was represent, that the stakeholders in public education had representation. Um, I plan on bringing that same type of res representation uh, to Harrisburg for you guys. Um, I think that it's absolutely imperative that we have somebody who represents the people instead of special interests and lobbyists. Therefore, I, well, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, but um, after riding a bike 150 miles to Harrisburg, um, to show you all that I'm committed to representing you guys, regardless of my circumstances, regardless of your circumstances, I will be there to represent you. I think we need somebody who's going to step out on the lines regardless of how controversial these issues are. Because without that, we're just going to succumb to whatever pockets are being lined. Um, and I think that this is exactly what Governor Wolf was, was touching on. So um, if you're looking for a style of representation that is absolutely comprehensive for our constituents, um, then I think that you should look this way. Um, so I thank the citizens of A Healthier Jessa for putting this on. I think that this is extremely important to make sure that the citizens are informed on each candidate before casting a vote. Um, and uh, I humbly ask for your vote on May 15th. Mr. Mullins. Okay, I, I must thank the uh, Troop Civic Center and uh, Troop Civic Leaders for hosting us tonight. 
Um, I thank you, Dave, for, uh, for officiating and doing a marvelous job. I thank uh, my, uh, th this, this uh, panel of candidates. It's not easy uh, to put yourself out there and, um, and, and get out there in, uh, in delightful weather we've had and knock on doors and, and put your experience and your ideas and your, your thought, heart, and mind, uh, your thoughts, heart, and mind uh, on, the, on the line. Um, so I, I thank these gentlemen uh, for taking a similar leap. Um, I thank my wife for her absolute patience uh, and support uh, through this process. And I thank you all, a, a full auditorium of people coming to, uh, coming to gather information on this very important and critical um, election. I'm running because I believe in our community. I always have, I always will. Um, I believe that public service should play uh, a part in everyone's life. And I believe that effective public service can truly improve lives. Um, I want to improve our job climate uh, so my son and your children and future generations can build a, a home and, and, a, and a dream and a life of their own here in this incredible, incredible community. I'm proud to have been raised here. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to uh, now build a family of our own. Uh, but we, we must do better in this seat. We must do better in Harrisburg. We must make up for some lost time. Uh, I believe uh, we need to fight. We need someone down there uh, who will fight for good jobs and good wages. Uh, someone who will fight uh, for women and fair wages and, and all of the, uh, and they need a champion in Harrisburg. Uh, I believe our children deserve to feel safe and adequately educated in school. I believe that we must serve our seniors and veterans, uh, at least attempt to try to uh, serve them in the way they've served us. And I believe we need real government reforms, like ending gerrymandering, per diems paid to lawmakers, state leased vehicles. It is time to rebuild the faith and trust in our government leaders. And I believe this, uh, this election, this district, is being watched incredibly closely to see how we pass or fail that test. I ask for your vote uh, because I believe uh, in this community. I believe that I will bring my experience and dedicated leadership to Harrisburg on day one because that's what the district needs. I thank you and I ask you for your vote. And finally, Mr. Castellani. Thank you, Dave, and a great job you did tonight. I want to thank the citizens for a healthy Jessup. And just to give you a little background on myself, I was a three-term tax collector in Blakely for 12 years. So uh, getting back to my brother's comment about seeing thousands of dollars being handled um, within the town, I have seen property taxes directly as a tax collector. Um, I'll never quit on you, ever, ever. I'm here from start to finish, if elected. And I'll never be a puppet. No one will ever have strings on my back telling me what to do or how to do it. I want to give a little bit on my platform really, really quickly. I'm the only candidate up here that's going to give 20% back of their salary. And the reason why I'm doing this is, I was asked many times, why would you give your money back to the district? Because we need it. There's charitable organizations out there that need money. There's drug awareness programs that need money. There's a lot of a lot of organizations that don't get enough back from Harrisburg that could use a small bit that I could provide as your state representative. I want to have town meetings once a month so everyone could attend. So there will be no transparency. I'll get to hear what everybody has to say. You'll let me know what's important. And this I could take back to Harrisburg. I will vote on property tax, like I said. There'll be no going back and forth. It's something I want to be, I wanted eliminated, and it's something that's very, very important, especially for senior citizens. Um, I'm going to humbly ask you for your vote on May 15th. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for all coming out. Thanks for taking part in democracy. And personal thank you to the Citizens for a Healthy Jessup for trusting me tonight with the questioning. Have a great night.